We're in Studies 376, Christian Origins. We have some idea of the books that we're going to be using in this class. Um, I don't know if you were down in the bookstore. Any of you been down to the bookstore to see what they have there? What did you find? You want to hold any of them up that we can see what we have there? I didn't see that. What have you got? Let's see what have you got. What do they say? I can't see them from here. Josephus and Josephus, both penguins. Yeah. Right, that's it. What about that interlinear? They didn't have the interlinear, the Greek, uh, the Greek. They did. They did. They did. But if you're a real serious student of this subject, you would it'd be good to have it for your life because I've been able to circle words that I wanted to know and carefully follow those words. And if you're really interested in the study of the New Testament and you know, if you're really interested in issues regarding Christ, Christian origins in Palestine, uh, you can't go wrong with a book like that. Uh, Josephus is, of course, something you'll have to be reading on your own. Uh, Josephus is, uh, we spoke a bit about Josephus, but uh, with Josephus, as we said, you have the most uh, encyclopedic presentation of data uh, in this historical period. That you could never imagine having for any historical period before the time of the printing press. And if this dark ages in England in the five, six hundreds or four hundreds, whatever it's supposed to be, what do you think is going on in Lithuania at that time? They're living and things are happening, but there's no there is no record. So to have something like Josephus for the period of Jesus Christ is what? Absolutely staggering source, particularly as he's got an encyclopedic mind. If you've looked at his um, work, how many have looked at it at all? See, he's got so many names and towns and, uh, you know, I mean, he tells you, I mean, there must be a cast of characters there in the thousands. And they're real live people. I told you some of my problems with the New Testament, the Gospels in particular, or Acts even more so. You can't even be sure that these are real life people. I know they are presented as real life people, but they don't come through as real life people. Uh, plus, the uh, uh, the Gospels and Acts drop them. <laughs> you don't uh, you don't follow them anywhere most of them. I mean, okay, Peter looks like he may be important, but I mean, aside from one or two notices here and there, the literature doesn't follow him. We don't know what he does in Asia Minor. We don't know how he got to Rome. We don't know what he does in Rome. We're some sort of, uh, some in the early church literature, some intimations that he may have been uh, crucified in Rome at some point, but no data about how, why, where, even the date. So you know you're not following a normative historical narrative in those documents, however affectionately you may or may not feel towards them. So, so they may be helpful, they may not be helpful. I mean, um, how are we going to distinguish someone like James the brother of John from James the brother of Jesus? <coughs> we think we can distinguish them, but can we distinguish them? Are they really two different people? Or has someone sort of been playing a shell game with us in order to downplay one's importance and throw you off the track that this person may have been more important than we think he was? Why do I say that? Well, if you notice in the book of Acts, when we get to it, we will get to it. James, the brother of John, who you may have heard of, he's the one most people think we are speaking about when we speak about James disappears from Acts in the same chapter that James, the brother of Jesus, appears. I mean, one disappears and the other appears. And uh, if you, of course, I'm a bit puzzled when I said that. Well, of course you'd be puzzled if you don't read these things carefully. If you've just gone to a church, you haven't read them carefully. You're not looking at them to see if they're consistent. You're not looking to see what little things are occurring 
that you may not have paid attention to that may have a bearing on the historical progression of events. So as I saw, I saw one or two puzzled faces, people who think they know these scriptures. But out of all the people in the class here who may think they know these scripture, how many would know that James, the brother of John, is removed from the narrative at the same moment that James, the brother of Jesus, is introduced into the narrative? Almost nobody would have picked, picked that up. Well, that's extremely important because James, the brother of Jesus, is not introduced. He just appears in the, in, in the narrative about five or ten lines after the other James was disappeared, beheaded, as he's put in the narrative. And then suddenly Peter escapes from prison, and the next thing we know he's going to leave a message for James. But we were never all told who James was. So the whole introduction to this important James and how come Peter has to go leave a message for him, if indeed that actually occurred, and why Peter needs to leave a message for him, what's the role of James? Is James more important than Peter, which in fact it turns out to be the case by implication as you wrestle with the material. But we've been taught that Peter is the most important person after Jesus. But if you look carefully at the material, he clearly isn't. Uh, Acts doesn't think he's the most important person because Acts is interested in one person, one person only. Who's that? Who? Paul. Paul. It gives Peter short shrift. A few things about Peter, and then Peter leaves town, and the next thing you know, it just is zeroes in on its main hero, Paul. And so we would say Acts is written from a Pauline perspective. Now, one of the reasons I gave you this compendium here, we won't read them completely ourselves, we don't have time in here, but I give you two, two uh, maternals here, the Recognitions of Clement, which is only the first book, which is really the most important, and some material from the Homilies of Clement, which have a different perspective than that. These are called uh, pseudepigraphic books. These are books that um, I mean, these are uh, a, a narrative. Uh, now, uh, Hellenist mean they're written in the Hellenistic period around the Mediterranean Greek by somebody or some people. And the authorities, the people in power who control thought, and therefore, they would be called pseudo. Whatever they said would be pseudo. In other words, you're not to think that these are really something to do with someone called Clement. These are false Clements. Who do you think labeled them false Clements? The church. Because the church wanted to already make you feel like, one, this was forbidden material, and uh, something that was less that was less reliable than it might otherwise be thought of being, and uh, it was actually false. They're trying to say it's part of a. We've now got to the point where we have a whole category of writing is called pseudepigraphy. False. Right. False right. Again, it's all writings that pretend to be something, but they're not. Well, if you want the opinion of most scholars, the honest opinion of most contemporary modern scholars would be that all these writings are superpigraphal. Acts is superpigraphal. The Gospels are superpigraphal. Writings under a false pen name. They may be written by the people they claim to be written by. They may not. Nobody has made any final determinations about that. The same with the pseudocompetents. The pseudocompetents are no better or no worse than these other writings. They're all of the same character. The point is that, in, as I told you last time, in the 300s, a church conference was held in which the process began of um, canonizing certain books. And then at the same time declaring other books 
decanonized or heretical. So the moment you got into a situation where there were true books and false books, then you get into the whole thing about heresy. And when you get into heresy, you start to get into controlling heresy. When you get into controlling heresy, you start getting into burning at the stake. Well, to the face. So by the time of the Middle Ages, anyone with heretical opinions was considered fair game for burning. And that went all the way up to Joan of Arc. And I mean, you get people being burned up to the 15th century. In England, they were still burning people in the 15th century, in, in, in the 1500s. I think in Italy and Spain in the 1600s. And they have all the records of the Inquisition. And you know, it gets pretty frightening. So. But when you think of what went on for 15 or for 13, 12, 13 centuries as a result of this process of orthodox versus unorthodox, and by those who were in charge of what was considered to be Christian, and even people like Galileo were, I would say, silenced, frightened into you know, submission. He didn't want to be burned. It was be burned or shut up and recant. And he chose shut up and recant. Because there have been people before him, Giordano, Bruno, and others who were burned. So uh, this, this problem of calling things heretical is a, has a very bad effect on thinking, creative thinking, as you know. So we're just coming out of that period. So in our little way, in a class like this, I think we're trying to promote civilization. That is open-mindedness, looking at other sources, not declaring anything heretical a priori, looking at all texts equally, even though we might personally favor some. People who haven't looked at these things, oh, you can't say anything bad about Paul, he's our saint. Well, you haven't looked at Paul. It's because of Paul that you're burning people. <laughs> it's because he, he says in Galatians, anyone who teaches a, do a gospel different from my own, he is to be accursed. So that's right at the beginning of, of, of the way. Pizza twice. Well, on that basis, people like Eusebius, three, four hundred years later, went to work cursing people who preached the gospel different from the one that they were promoting. We're getting that in these, in these materials here. So if I come to a passage like that and I show them, or we come to Paul, what Paul says. Um, I'm a Greek to the Greek, a Jew to the Jew, a lawkeeper to the lawkeeper, a lawbreaker to the law breaker. I will do whatever I have to do to win. Then he said, all the fighters at the stadium, using the imagery of stadium athletics, which he knew in Palestine was a horde, because the Jews and the all peoples did like gymnasiums because people oiled their bodies and went naked in them. And it was considered irreligious to be involved in things. So he then purposely uses the imagery to upset them of stadium athletics. He says, all of the runners at the stadium are running for a prize. And, but I run for a prize, their prize withers. I run for a prize that will never wither, then using stadium boxing. That's how I fight, like the boxers, not beating the air. So he tells you his agenda. What is his agenda? Winning. And you know he'll have to do whatever he has to do to win. And he does. And by the way, Paul does win. Paul has won. We are products of Pauline um, theology, thinking, and uh, the mindset. So someone like James, who is Paul's really inveterate opponent, and someone Paul is always criticizing by implication in his letters, and we'll see that, is not up to dealing with Paul, because James is called the righteous one. He's perfectly righteous. He has no God. He doesn't do things to win. He doesn't, you know, plot the thing out so he's going to win and the other person's going to, going to, going to lose. He's just out there for righteousness good or bad. And when we see him, we find that that's exactly the way he is. And that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls to a certain extent are. And guess what? That's why they all lose. That's why they all lose, because they're dealing with much more diabolical people than they are. 
So, we have to take the pseudo-clementines and throw the word pseudo away. We have to just take them as equal documents to anything else. There are no pseudo-documents, there are just documents. Uh, no documents are canonical, no documents are apocryphal. One document is not superior to another unless it's proven to be so by the content that it contains. All information, all its sources, all input has to be treated equally until it has some characteristic that would disqualify it. Now that's how I would treat the material in this period. Whether it comes from a source like Islam, or a source of uh, Christian Church Fathers, or a Jewish source, or uh, Josephus, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, all these have to be treated equally. Now, I have said in my introductory statements that there are materials, and I don't mean to be harsh, in the Gospels that, to my mind, undermine some of their credibility. That is the miracle stories, the exorcism material. Those are favorite things, and they're very appealing to uh, young people or people in church environments, and that's not, that's not surprising. They're inspiring. But it's not something historically in a normal, equal historical setting that we'd be willing probably on a historical basis to credit. You follow what I'm trying to say? I mean, something I say in all my classes, you may have heard it in other classes, if you take classes with me, is that, and I'm going to stop all this preamble and get to the subject matter that we need, need to do in a moment, but it's just introductory stuff. If you notice, people are prepared to accept in the past things that they're not prepared to accept in the present. Whereas they will credit things that happen, uh, miracle tales of that kind. Those are things that I think detract from the believability of stories, uh, the, from the credibility of these things as a normal historical source. On the whole, I would take them as credible in terms of, there were probably the Jews or the Hebrews were in forced labor in Egypt in a certain period of time. And they probably did go out at some politically troubled moment from Egypt. All that, I think, is, is uh, recommends itself to possibly being accurate. And there was a, maybe a leader who came from the Egyptian upper class. He may have been born Jewish, he may not have been born Jewish. You know, Freud wrote a whole book about that. Do you know the book that Freud wrote about that? He was very upset about his origins and had to try to deal with this whole issue on the basis of German research as it was at that time. It's called Moses in Monotheism. And Freud said that if it walks like a duck, if it talks like or quacks like a duck, if it looks like a duck, then it is a duck. Moses looked like an Egyptian, talked like an Egyptian, spoke Egyptian, needed his brother Aaron to translate for him because he was slow of speech. Freud says, well, he was an Egyptian. And the stories in the Hebrew Bible basically Hebrewize him. Say, oh, well, he really wasn't an Egyptian. You know, he was put into bulrushes, and the Pharaoh's daughter brought him up, but he was really a Jewish child, and so on. So there's all these stories meant to Hebraicize him, but Freud contends he was really an Egyptian who brought the religion of Ignatin after Ignatin, the sun, one god sort of ruler in Egypt that had switched. You see a lot about him on television. Of the religion. They have learned, but just been learned about Ignatan, the, um, the sun god, one god of Pharaoh, who changed the religion of Egypt about the time of uh, Moses. So uh, the Freud position is that uh, some of Ignatan's um, associates got a hold of uh, the Hebrew slave tribes and taught Ignatan's religion to them. It's, a, you know, it's an attractive thesis. It, it, there probably is some, uh, some uh, truth to it. And he probably did have a successor called Joshua and so on and so forth. But then the other stuff, like parting the Red Sea and things like that, you know, you begin to, you know, I've seen the Cecil B. DeMille picture of it, you know, uh, walls of water on either side. Uh, you, we sure it didn't look like that, but we know that there were cataclysms at that time. We know that uh, Santorini erupted uh, uh, several centuries either prior to that or at the same time. We know there were great tidal waves. So all that can be actually rationalized if you get enough data about the period to see how the story began, came into being, but not that Moses did it all with his wand. All of us, I think, 
are not going to credit that as an actual occurrence. But there were magicians back then. You know, people who play, and you know, magicians are very tricky. And people who, who look like uh, 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 magicians, and apparently, in the Egyptian markets and in other places like Crete and other places, you could make a snake assume a, 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 a stiff rigor mortis type position, you know, when you were entertaining crowds, and then pick him up, and then he would then begin to do that again. So there are things that are done by, you know, shaman type leaders and magician type people with these groups. So all those kind of stories are explainable in terms of natural phenomena to some extent. But when you get to the stories in the gospel, walking on the waters, and um, those detract from an historian's view of their reliability. They may, it may not be you, you follow me? If you're a person of faith, those may be the things you like the most. So this is, the Greeks love superheroes, Hercules, the demigods, all these people, like this normal. We love Jesus, so we like these stories about Jesus, but whether this is history or something else, so that, that's, the, that's the problem. And, uh, in a class, as we said, you have to be willing to separate out what recommends itself historically from what is super history, supernatural history. Supernatural history belongs in the church, the mosque, the synagogue, the Buddhist temple. And whatever else we can do in the university, we will do. But super history, probably we're not going to be able to deal with. All right, that being said, let's go over to Eusebius. Eusebius is a good place to um, start. And um, uh, you guys, what we're trying to do by reading you see this is fill in the missing pieces. Let me first just sketch Jewish history up to this time. So everyone is starting from the same point, all right? Do you think that would be fair to do? You don't mind if I bore you if you already know it. How many people they all know it? So let's say we start with Abraham. So Abraham actually go way back to Adam. But you get these supernatural, superhuman beings go from Adam to the flood, Noah. The Jews reckon that as 5,000 something years ago. I don't think we can rely on their days. But then you get these supernatural patriarchs that live 900 years. Uh, th th those are things they've probably been handed down by oral tr transmission to them. Anyway, so the, the, the myth is, 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 is easier to assimilate than the actual history. I had a professor at college who put this very succinctly. Poetry is truer than history. It's not what really did happen. It's what the poet said happened that was the real history, because that's what dominated their view of what history was. Not what actually did happen. Okay, so these stories, you know, are ancestors that they thought they might have had. We come down to Abraham. That would be around 3,000 or 2,500 B.C. or so. Then we know Abraham has these different children, Ishmael, Isaac, and so on. But the Hebrews, are, by that point, are, are cutting loose the other descendants. They're only interested in the chosen line as they see it, the line coming down to their ancestors. They don't care about Ishmael any more than they care about Jacob's brother Esau. So with Abraham, you come down to the key figure of Jacob, who becomes Israel according to the biblical account, when he, when he gets God's blessing and so on. It fulfills the promises, takes on a new name, and this name is interesting, Israel. El is God, even in Arabic, Allah comes from El. Is in Hebrew is, can be a man and can be a future. So normally speaking, Ish, it's really Ish in Hebrew. Uh, as this is interpreted in the Bible, by the poet, man is El, God, and they tell a story about how Jacob wrestled with God. So this word Ra, or Sarah, or whatever, is interpreted in terms of having a struggle with God. And that's how they, that's a poetic, that's not a struggle. Because probably what this actually meant was Israel, the same as Ishmael, is Ishmael. The Arab. This means God hears. Ishmael, God hears. This is Israel, same form. God rules. But that's not how the poet presented it. But I'm sure that was what the original meaning of the term was. This is the people who have no other king but God 
whom God rules. And I think that's a much more satisfying understanding of the term Israel than the one you get in the Bible. Okay, so this is around, let's say, 2000 BC. By this time, they're reckoning all his children as part of who they are. So we get the 12 tribes, all his sons as such. All this is still pretty mythological, I think, but it's genealogical. And then we keep coming down here to one, one tribal son becomes particularly important, Joseph, because he's the one who goes to Egypt. So that's uh, 17 to 16th century. And um, he, he blazes the way to Egypt. Yeah, what's wrong? Yeah, four minutes of Yeah, that's right. Well, we're done. So he blazes the way to, uh, to Egypt there. And then um, from, from Joseph, uh, which is, we have a captivity period, and then we have a Moses somewhere around the 13th or 14th century, two or three hundred, 20 years later, according to the Bible. And he's from a different tribe. And then um, we have an exodus of sorts, and then Joshua is his, uh, is his assistant, and a conquest period in Palestine. And so we're down into around the 1200 period of Judges, 1100 BC. And then finally we get the Davidic monarchy coming out of that, rising up, which is about 1000 BC, and the rise of the first temple under David, and David is not strong enough to keep his kingdom together under Solomon, 900 Solomon, and then it, it falls apart, so you get two kingdoms, one the north called Israel, the divided monarchy, the south called Judah, and you're from about 900 to 700 BC. 700 BC, the Assyrian conquest knocks off the, the north, and you're left with only the south, Jews. So from that moment, you have Judea coming from Jews, no more Israelites. So from here on in, we're with Judeans, which comes into Arabic as Yehud, Europeans, Yudah, Yudim, 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 Yudim in German, English somehow got to be Jew. So there are no Jews after that period. 600. This collapses with Nebuchadnezzar, the first temple coming from David is destroyed. We get a captivity period for another 40 years or so. The uh, returnees start to come back around 540 to about 440. Nothing much is happening. Nehemiah and Ezra are in that period. And only a smattering of returnees come back from Babylon. That's the captivity period. And the, and the Bible comes to a close. We have a few other writings that are sort of scatty after that, but actually the Bible goes into a dark period. And until the Maccabean period, which is 200 BC, or around 175 BC, we don't have a lot of concrete information. We're really in a dark period. But then we come out of it with writers like Josephus and others, and what brings us down to the period of the Romans. First, the struggle with the Greeks that produced the holiday that the Jews today even remember it as Hanukkah dedication of the temple, and then finally the Roman storming of Jerusalem under Pompey in 67 BC, Pompey being Caesar's erstwhile colleague and ultimately his enemy that Caesar uh, struggled with, and that's the exact moment of Roman takeover. So the Roman takeover in Palestine that we're dealing with that sets the background to the Christian story a hundred years later is a hundred years before the so-called ministry of Christ. It's uh, 60 or 70 years before the birth of uh, this figure that we call Christ, and before his actual activity is a good 100 years. So you have to understand, we have 100 years of foreign occupation acting itself out in various ways uh, prior to this. And uh, we'll pick up there next time, but um, I hope that filled in a few pieces for you to start with speaking quickly. And uh, it's very easy once you can digest it all. Thanks a lot, Noel. Oh, let me see how to turn it off, right? Uh, stop. No. So we're, uh, we're trying to get down this history. And um, we did the Maccabean uh, uprising and basically the, the Roman Civil War that uh, was involved to some extent in the various Roman conquests of Palestine. 
And then, in fact, the rise of the Herodian family, which is very important for the New Testament. You know, all the New Testament episodes, if uh, you're familiar with the various presentations, make it clear that um, Jesus' birth has something to do with one of the Herods. Emperors is doing a census, so it has both to do with the Roman Empire on the one hand and Luke and in Matthew, the other story of his birth, uh, Herod wanting to kill all the Jewish children or some such uh, idea of that kind. Not documented, by the way, in Josephus. Um, so, it's good to know who these people were and who the Pharisees to some extent were and how these groups came into existence and so on. So, after the fallout around, when was the first Roman conquest of Jerusalem? Did you get that out of your notes? 63 BC. 63 BC is the when Pompey, or Pompey as he's I think pronounced actually in Latin, stormed Jerusalem. And Pompey, as you may recall, was one of Caesar's triumvirs, the triumvirate. Caesar, Pompey, and Caesar at the west, Pompey the east, and someone in the middle. Lepidus, I think his name was. That would be the 70, 60 BC period, and Pompey took Jerusalem. Now, in that process, Herod's family began to rise. Because the intermediary in the process of bringing the Roman troops into the country, they probably would have come anyway, but Herod's father, whose name I think was Antipater, maybe the wrong, but I think that's right. Herod's father was the instrumental sort of intermediary. Now, Eusebius will give his origins here. And if you've been reading Eusebius, he claims that Herod and his father were what origin? Greek. Greek. Greek and Arab. Greco, Greco, Greco Arabs. This is not a Hebrew family. And that's what is missed by everybody who does the history of this period. And it's the first thing that undermines the presentation of the gospel because Herod is being uh, uh, portrayed as a representative Jewish king. That is the most serious flaw of people's knowledge of this period. Herod is presented as a, basically, uh, that he's a Jew and he's a king of the Jews, and in some sense he's rightfully there, and in, uh, his family is rightfully there, and uh, maybe not people don't love him or his family, but uh, He's representative of Jewish interests and so on, and therefore any things that he does wrong can be blamed on Jews. Well, it's just total, that's right from the start, total talkless. Right from the get-go, Herod is a Greco-Arab. His family is Greco-Arab. If they are Judaized at all, and that's open to question, it's a superficial uh, in order to ingratiate themselves to some extent, which they never succeeded in doing, with the population over which they were put in control. Now, how did they get control? They parlayed a Roman governorship into a dynasty. And so Herod's father, with contacts both on the Greek coast and more inland on the other side of the Jordan River. I think we could draw a map here. This thing works. It is working. Okay, so they came from here. We know where Gaza is. Jerusalem is up here. So this coastline was pretty Hellenized, Greco, Grecified. The main Jewish Hebrew concentration of the population were there. It always had been. Funny, the thing is, it's totally reversed now. That's where the Palestinians are to some extent. And the Jews are on the coastline. So uh, it's totally inverted to some extent. In any event, over here, the 
There's a place called Petra. I have this map in my chamber. And that's pictured a little bit in the, in, in the Gospel of the birth of Christ, the, the, the tradesmen coming. But where they hang out, they, on the street, they hung out here. This was like a stop. This became very wealthy. And in time, this became known as Arabs, these people here. And an Arab king. Now, it turns out that Herod's father had connections there. And he married a woman from there. And apparently the story in Eusebius is that he was kidnapped. He was a, the son of a priest in the temple of Apollo here. And he was kidnapped and taken over there and grew up there and made good connections. So he had Greco-Arab connections. Over here he was well connected. That's terribly important when you look at the picture of King Herod against Jesus. See, we think of it as the Jews being blue meanings. <laughs> but nothing to do with the Jews being blue meanings at all. The Jews hated Herod. Hated the Herod in dynasty. Struggled for 200 years to get rid of it. Or maybe a little less than that. You know, struggled constantly. Charismatic leaders like John the Baptist lost their life in that process. And this is totally unappreciated by the public at large because of the uh, agenda of the people who constructed the documents that we hold sacred. And the agenda out there is unfortunately anti-Semitic. The reason being that it's written mostly by Greeks, for Greeks, at a time when the Jews were in bad odor in the Roman Empire because they were unruly, obstreperous, and refused to surrender and give in. So the whole thing was is to portray them as the you know negative people who are causing all the trouble. It may or may not have been. Messianic movement certainly was troublesome. It was a subversive underground movement that was threatening the Roman Empire. And the, the Romans were in every way intent on trying to suppress. Because it was a movement, as we saw in time, that would not give in and and and, and um, was capable of taking new forms, mutating into new forms. One of the new forms is the religion that we are all familiar with, Christianity. Whether that's the original form in Palestine is what we're going to have to discover in this class. We know we have a messianic movement, and now we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are like a time capsule. That's why they're so important. A native Palestinian literature that was did not go through the editorial process of the <coughs> Roman Empire. That's a huge thing, and a massive literature to boot from approximately this period, which is also messianic. So we've got a control now that we never had before. And the more I personally work on it, the more I find it useful to be able to apply that to our documents, not always with a salutary effect. But when you find out that you have a colonial situation where a king has been imposed against the will of the native population, that has an effect on the way you look at the situation. So this Herod's father is the intermediary in this process. And uh, as Pompey storms Jerusalem, with the help of collaborating Jewish groups too, and if you study the history carefully, you'll see that there's two brothers of the native Maccabean dynasty, that was the nationalist dynasty, uh, that, are, that are fighting each other for control. The well, younger brother is more popular. The older brother is the uh, high priest. He is uh, basically thrown out by his younger brother. And that high priest, therefore, is involved with Herod's father as one of his uh, operatives or uh, someone he uses for or is used by him for uh, relations with this Petra place. So when the Romans take over, they destroy the Maccabean uh, family, basically, take the one and change the Romans, I told you. And the second thing is, the first Roman governor after the generals uh, depart is Herod's father. And so we now have a situation of foreign control, colonial control, of unpopular government over a people that's very obstreperous and um, extremely zealous in certain religious matters. And this new government is not going to measure up to their standards. 
We get an indication of that even in the New Testament with John the Baptist, who's clearly a popular, charismatic leader. Now, he is Jewish from the countryside of some kind, out in the wilderness, like the Dead Sea Scrolls people. And he loses his head in some manner in struggle with the Herodian family. It's some abstruse legal issues are put in the New Testament story. But those are not backed up in Josephus' presentation of them. Uh, as I told you before, Josephus in the antiquity says that John was killed because Herod, and by this time all the Herods are calling themselves Herod. The reason is, like Caesar, they model themselves on Caesar. Uh, the Herod, Herod saw Caesar as the pattern of a person who rose and made his family into um, kings and emperors. And after that, they were all called Caesar. So all Herods are being called Herod and Palestine ever after the family, when after the family takes real control. And the family's taking real control here between the 60s and the 30s. That's when they're taking real control. So all this is just prior to the birth of Jesus, but not maybe to the birth of Jesus' parents. And uh, certainly we don't know about Joseph because, in fact, Joseph isn't even supposed to be the father from what the documents we know uh, present. So we can zero more on the mother. The mother has a Maccabean name, Mary or Miriam. She's the last Maccabean princess that Herod forcibly married, then executed, and then executed her children by him because he was jealous that they might supplant him executed her brother because he thought they were more popular than he was. So uh, if you were named Mariam or Miriam in 30 BC, you probably were a Maccabean sympathizer. So since all the early Christians have Maccabean names, by Maccabean names I mean Judas, Simon, Mary, Miriam, uh, John, these are all Maccabean names of the Maccabean ruling dynasty in this uh, in the period of 160 to 60. These are all names that were being used in the Maccabean family. So you're naming yourself after Maccabean heroes. So I think that's very underappreciated in terms of the situation that we're talking about. So Josephus tells us that this Antipater turned this governorship into a, into a dynasty with Roman sponsorship and agreement, and that all his heirs in perpetuity were to be Roman citizens forever after for the services they rendered to Rome. And I told you previously that I think, in my book, I think, and I'm way ahead of myself, that's where Paul got his Roman citizenship from, because I've already uh, assumed that Paul is uh, a member of uh, this very large Herodian family <clears throat> the time we get into the first century. You say, how do you know? Well, I told you last time that he sends his regards in Romans to his cousin, the little Herod. That's a pretty, pretty strong, if that's accurate, indication that he has some relation with the Herods. Uh, also, this community that's described in Acts is composed of at least one member who was the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, it says in Acts. This person who was the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, Herod the Tetrarch is the person who killed John the Baptist. And he's supposed to be his foster brother, and he's in Paul's community in Antioch as a founding member. So there are lots of indications that just uh, uh, circumstantial. They're not just circumstantial evidence, but it, it builds up into a into a presumption as, uh, as you go along with this. Uh, in any event, um, to go back to where we were, uh, we don't have Herod as king yet. So Antipater, uh, there's a lot of Jewish unrest. And in the midst of this, that's what we're talking about, Caesar and Octavian. We're getting uh, the assassination of Caesar in 44, and then the struggle between Mark Antony and Octavian in the uh, 30s that ended I think in 31 with the Battle of Actium but in the middle of this struggle 
we get Herod, Antipater's son, very unpopular uh, person, who had been under his father, governor of Galilee. Where do we get this information from? Josephus. So we have very detailed information in this period. And as governor of Galilee, he had executed what is called in Josephus, uh, 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 killed or executed bandits. You have to be careful of the word bandits, because uh, bandits is often a, 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 a euphemism for freedom fight. And apparently Herod had executed some Galilean freedom fighters or bandits. We know that they must have been more than just bandits because one of their names was Hezekiah. And that is a Davidic king name. One of the last Davidic kings at the time of the Babylonian conquest was called Hezekiah. And it turns out that his descendants are making pretensions to be kings. His descendants are making, so this is not just a normal bandit. This is someone who's uh, at the head of an insurgency of some kind. In any case, the so-called Sanhedrin, this is a new body that didn't exist before. It comes into existence around the time the Romans take over. It's a kind of representative body of so-called Jewish notables. 70 members, and that's why Jesus sends out the 70, for instance, in the, in the New Testament. I mean, you don't have 12 apostles for a tent on a mission, because, I mean, 12 apostles means one to each tribe in theory, in theory. though by this time there aren't any tribes as such, and there's really only Judah left by this time, and Levites, or the priest class. There are no others, even though claims are made about being Benjamin. There really are no Benjaminites as such left, though some people may have been making Benjaminite claims. Benjamin is a particular thing, and I think that Paul's the only one we know making such a claim. I think it would in time will have to do with this Herodian problem. The reason being that you'll see there's a similar genealogy in the Bible for Benjaminites and Edomites. They have the same genealogy in the Bible, so there's some overlap there. And I think that the Idumeans, which is what the Herodians were also considered to be, Idumeans or Edomites, or what we would call Edomites, Greek Edomites, were maybe making Benjaminite claims to legitimatize themselves when the Herodian family started coming in, but that's a, not, that's a very, you know, thing. But in any case, um, point is you're getting constant struggle here with it, against the background of the Roman struggle. And in the back, against the Roman struggle of these people like Octavian and so on, Herod gets a Roman army. Even though, and, and he had been governor, we got, he was governor of Galilee, he was very unpopular. Sanhedrin actually had called him to account wanting to execute him for having killed this so-called bandit chief. So the Sanhedrin didn't think it was a bandit chief. They thought he had overstepped his authority as governor. And what he did was he marched into the Sanhedrin with his soldiers and basically dismissed them. So he was not popular, he was very unpopular. And ultimately, the Persians came in while the Romans were fighting each other. They were power further east, and for a while Persians reasserted control, it's all in Josephus in around the 40s. Therefore Herod fled to Rome and got a Roman army with the sponsorship of Mark Anthony, who had been his father's friend. He'd been his father's friend, and he got a Roman army, came back, stormed Jerusalem in 37 BC, and put himself in power with Roman soldiers. The one party that Josephus makes it clear was not willing to resist were the Pharisees. They consistently are the peace party and recommended the people to open the gates to Herod. The people don't open the gates to Herod. So the claim that the Pharisees are the popular party is only a 
misnomer foisted by their later heir. <coughs> so, in any case, um, you rarely get Pharisees defined as seeking accommodation with foreigners, but that's in fact probably the best way. Normally you'll hear them nitpickers, but everyone was a nitpicker over the legal things. The Dead Sea Scrolls people are nitpickers over legal things, but they hate the Pharisees. So being a nitpicker over legal things is not sufficient to tell the difference between the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's what I mean with the new document. We have a treasure trove since 48 of a discovery of a contemporary literature that is not, see the Pharisees, whatever you say, have gone through the editorial process of the Roman Empire. When the Jews surrendered to Rome in 70 AD and the last holdouts committed suicide in 73, the Pharisees were the only party the Romans were willing to live with. Because the Pharisees were the only party who accepted Roman um, government in Palestine. Except for the Pauline Christians as they developed. Because the Pauline Christians through Paul's writings in Romans. How many have read Romans? Romans 13. This, I could read the passage, but I don't have to. You can find it. Romans 13, 1 to 13. For him, God has already given judgment on behalf of the Romans. Well, this is a guy walking around with a Roman citizenship. And uses it to save himself on several occasions. So, in fact, it's not surprising that's his outlook. I don't think Jesus had a Roman citizenship. So, these are two different, these are two different species of fish. And the one does not represent what the other is, or vice versa. Though that's what our documents are attempting to show us. That one, in fact, does understand the other, even better than his own followers or apostles. I think that uh, that is uh, not something historically that would stand up to uh, scrutiny. That's just what's in the letters of Paul. But there's other groups who caused the war against Rome. More zealot messianic groups who don't accommodate to anyone. Who think you shouldn't pay taxes to Rome. Who think that only God rules here. And so on and so forth. So these are holdouts in various areas and the scroll documents represent that third group. And that's why we're so fortunate because now we have the third group, the mindset of the third group by which we can measure the other two. So you can't blame scholars before 1950 for not knowing this stuff. But after 1950, you can start to blame them because we now have the whole literature of the, of the third way, if you want to call it that way. The literature of the war against Rome, the mindset of the war against Rome, the literature of the native messianic movement, if you want to call it that. All kinds of things like that here, which are totally different than what we've been presented. And finally, it's clear, if you now read the letters of Paul in that context, that Paul is familiar with this group, that he spent time with this group, that he's using the vocabulary of this group, but he's turning it 180 degrees inside out. Anyway, let's go back now. So, we have a, uh, this Herod, who's very unpopular, has to go to Rome, get an army, under Mark Anthony, who sponsored his father, Come back, storm Jerusalem, only the Pharisees cooperate. He therefore executes all members of the previous Sanhedrin that opposed him, which includes so-called Sadducees and every other group, Maccabean groups, and so on. But we have Sadducees in the New Testament, right? But the Sadducees in the New Testament are not the Sadducees Herod executes before 37 BC. They're a new group that owe their existence to Herod and his family. So really, after that day, we should call these people Herodian Sadducees. But of course, they don't do that. They just call themselves Sadducees. What does Sadducee come from? Well, we think it comes from the word in Hebrew, Zadok. So translated into Greek, that becomes Saduk. And who was Zadok? So those people who know the Bible. Well, first of all, ZDK in Hebrew means righteousness or justice. Hebrew is a, a language based on three letter roots. And the ZDK is righteousness, justice. But in this case, it's a high priest. They have a high priest. The high priest of David's time. The first high priest of the first temple. That's what this term is um, relating to. 
a genealogical relationship to the first high priest of the first time. Whether they really had such a genealogy, you'll have to decide. But that's the conceit that they're making a genealogical claim as legitimate high priests over a thousand year period. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls are making Sadducee claims, but they're not like Herodian claims. The Dead Sea Scrolls say, we're led by sons of Zadok. But as she was saying, it could also mean sons of righteousness. In fact, several times in the scrolls you've come upon the term not sons of Zadok, or, but sons of righteousness, sons of Zedek. But that can also mean another word, Zadik. Because we don't know when a letter is double. They don't show you a double letter. It comes out in Greek as double. But in Hebrew, they don't show you the, the double. And you have to know that oracle. So, for instance, that means righteous one, the tzaddik, the righteous one. James was called the tzaddik, James the just, James the righteous one, James the tzaddik. So how does tzaddik differ from zadok in the writing? It would be the same. In Hebrew, the writing, because there wouldn't be any A, and there wouldn't be any double D, and all you'd find here is an I, but in this one and this one are the same. In Hebrew, written as the same letter. So you wouldn't be able to tell the difference of Zadok from Zadik in the original manuscript. And in the scrolls, you can't tell the difference. I know that, just confused you. But the point is that it's a very confusing language, unless you know it. But it also gives itself to a lot of wordplay. So the Dead Sea Scrolls may not be really talking about genealogical descent from the Zadok of David. It may be turning talking about righteous priests. As she said, like the letter of the Hebrews first talks about a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. But it clearly is trying to talk about righteous priests, not necessarily people descended from the pagan king Melchizedek. So there's a lot of wordplay. But anyway, these resistant Zadokites are not like the cooperative Zadokites. So one thing is clear, the Sadducees and the Pharisees of the New Testament are government-sponsored parties. And the government are the Herodians and the Roman governors. So they owe their uh, position to them. But you see, just to show you that they're not the popular parties, the popular parties as usual in every time and place are uh, the nationalist parties. These are not the nationalist parties. They're willing to take orders from Rome, therefore they would be considered collaboration parties. And sure enough, when the revolution occurs, when the war against Rome in 66 occurs, what's the first thing they do? Burn all the high priest palaces. Wait, so you don't have that in the New Testament. What do you mean? They're Christian? They're against the high priest? No, they're Jewish. They're against the high priest. And all the Herodian palaces, too. Why would they do that? These are their priests. No, they weren't. They never were. They were put upon them by foreign power whom they despised. Ultimately, burn all the rich and burn all the debt records. And as Josephus says, turn the poor against the rich, which is what? It's first class struggle in documented history, which is why Josephus hates the revolutionaries, because he's in the rich class. And he's gone over to the Romans and he hates them and he despises them. And he portrays them as negatively as he can, but he can't not admit the fact that they control things for a period of four years. I really got way beyond myself there. Uh, uh, what we'll do next time is, I, and we will start with this book, and I really think we're at a point now that we can start with this book, and we can just pick up. This is a book, as I told you, that was written by the person who helped bring about the takeover of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Eusebius was the bishop of Constantine who made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in the early 300s, 310, 320 period, and they called the first church council of Nicaea in 325, which Eusebius, the man who wrote this book, organized. So his ideas will be the official ideas of Christianity as they take over the Roman Empire. And some of them are quite frightening, actually. When you read this, you might, your, your hair can sometimes stand up in your head. Oh, that's fine. That's great. Thanks a lot. See you next time. That was way too much for you guys to get. No, I don't hold you responsible for any of that material. <laughs> Except in so far as you feel like bringing it into an essay. My essays will be more directed to what's in this book. But that gets us all on an equal, on an equal, on an equal footing. We know we're all on the same stage here. Because we've got to do some subject relating to what we're doing here. 
Okay, well, we're a bit behind here. I do apologize. I think we took a lot of time uh, trying to you know, do the backgrounds here. Uh, from my impression, we're basically up to snuff. Um, who, rem who remembers where we left off in the uh, background stuff? Did we get up to where we want to be? So, again, from 63 BC to the time of Christ and even onwards, you have constant Jewish uprising against the authorities. None of that is presented in the documents that were written. And I don't think that is, one, I don't think it's fair. It gives people the wrong impression. And two, it's not accurate. We have an uprisings in uh, all the way through the 50s and 40s BC. We have uprising in 37 BC when Herod dies in 4 BC. A huge uprising it's called the Temple Eagle Affair. Uh, they, they pull the Roman eagle down from the uh, down from the walls of the temple, that contrary to the customs of the ancestors. And Herod actually, they thought he was dead, but he wasn't dead. He revives. He's suffering some illness, so then he has everyone flailed and burned and executed who did this. And uh, there's uh, you know two charismatic leaders leading it. Then there's a guy called Judas the Galilean, who's covered in the Book of Acts who starts leading an, uh, a movement that we later will call Zealots. Now that's very important that he's called Galilean because as time goes on, Galilean is also another name for Christian in early church texts because they were all Galileans. When Peter is standing by the fire, if you know your Gospels, while Jesus is being examined inside the, the governor or high priest's palace, I forget which, they ask him, are you with this man? Uh, are you a Galilean? And he says, no. Well, we tell by your accent, you're a Galilean. Do they mean, does he come from Galilee, or is he a member of this revolutionary movement founded by Judas of the Galilean? And you see, Judas the Galilean did not come from Galilee. He came from a place that today we would call the Golan Heights. In uh, Josephus, it's called Golanitis. So you have um, this guy's really going to get upset. Uh, so Golan is over here. Galilee is here. There's a different area. He comes from a place called Golanitis up here. Josephus makes that very clear. So he's only called Galilean because his movement is the Galilean movement in some way, whatever that means. Anyway, Galilee is a hotbed of unrest throughout this whole period. We don't get that impression from the Gospels that it's a hotbed of unrest, political unrest. We get mobs who are following teachers who like miracles. We don't get any feeling it's like a peaceful, uh, it's, it's a hotbed of, of, of disaffection. You wouldn't be able to have a teacher walk around the way Jesus portrayed the Gospels in Galilee the way this place is. And then you have to say, well, why is this picture? Well, this is a picture that went through the editorial processes of the Roman Empire. That's one. That's for another day. So in any case, Duke Scalaean at 4 BC and 7 AD starts in two uprisings. In 7 AD, it's the tax uprising over the census. And he is teaching against the census along with another teacher, interestingly enough, called that Josephus. Paul Saduk or Zadok or somebody, and we don't know who that is. But it, you know, links up with these other things that we're talking about. Paul answers it in Romans 13. He says, the government of men authorities are appointed by God, therefore you owe uh, 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 um, tax or payments to those whom God has put in authority. And then it says, you should love your neighbor as yourself, therefore you should pay taxes. Uh, taking the, the most precious commandment of all these groups, Josephus portrays these two commandments, loving God and loving your fellow man, as the basic teaching of John the Baptist. The Gospels portray it as the basic teaching of Jesus. Josephus portrays it as the basic teaching of the Essenes, that we haven't even mentioned here. A third party, whose uh, literature we think we've discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We, 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 there are questions, of course, Josephus describes Essenes in great detail, but they're 
very much like John the Baptist. They they immerse themselves. They are daily bathers. They get up before the sun. But he describes all these things in two con in two contexts. Their duties towards God are their love of God, their piety towards God. And this is bathing, purity, and so on and so forth. Their duty towards their fellow men, loving your neighbor as yourself, is righteousness. So righteousness is all duties uh, surrounding how you relate to your fellow men. And all duties relating to how you relate to God is piety. Now I think that's very, very um, uh, rational way of dividing these things up. And... Uh, there then, Paul, knowing these things, because he's very knowledgeable about the situation in Palestine, says, okay, if you want to practice righteousness towards your fellow man, then you owe taxes. Now, Jesus deals with the tax issue in the Gospels, doesn't he? You know, the picture, and I say it's a picture because I'm not sure how historical it is. You'll have to determine that. He won't touch the coin, by the way, like an Essene didn't touch coins, according to Josephus. So he says, well, then render unto Caesar what is Caesar and God's what is God's, right? His picture is saying, he was ears, let him hear, often it means there's another meaning to this. But uh, he, 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 one interpretation, certainly the Zealot interpretation, with it, well, everything belongs to God, and nothing belongs to Caesar. So, uh, so uh, right under Caesar, you don't owe Caesar anything, you only owe God. Now, let me throw out one other point, just to make this whole picture clear. The Gospels, what sign are they on? Jesus is a personality that they picture. That's supposed to be historical. They picture Jesus eating with who? Publicans, we sometimes call them. They're tax collectors. So he prefers the company of tax collectors often to his own people. So that message comes through loud and clear. Jesus approves of tax collectors. That is not the Jesus of the revolutionary movements. That is the Jesus of a pro-Pauline uh, constituency that feels that tax collecting and so on and so forth is acceptable and part of your obligations. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls make it very clear that the tax collectors are not acceptable. You just have to decide what you think was really going on in Palestine at that time and what the Messiah at that, at that time really represented and whether these were the things uh, that would have been a part of the Messianic uh, movement. Now, the interesting thing is that the Gospels take this moment in both versions of Jesus' birth. They take the two revolutionary moments in Josephus as the time Jesus was born. Are you familiar with the Gospels? To the extent that which Gospels, first of all, deal with the issue of Jesus' birth? Luke and Matthew. Luke and Matthew. There you go. Two Gospels deal with Jesus' birth. Does John deal with Jesus' birth? No. Mark takes the same approach. Mark doesn't deal with any issues of Jesus' early life or birth. He only appears uh, out of you know, no one knows where or what among the followers of John the Baptist. But so we can say that I think that would be, if we were going to look for the story of Jesus, that would be a good place that everyone agrees that you should start that there's something in this movement of John the Baptist that gives rise to a personality that we now call Jesus. On the other side of it, Matthew and Luke do, rec do wrestle with this issue, don't they? But do they agree with each other on any point? No. Now, you see, most of our understanding of this is psychologically, we uh, conflate both narratives. So in our view, we have a fleshed out picture of Jesus from aspects of both narratives. But if you go back to the written word, put them side by side, as scholars do in these, uh, in these uh, what they call synopsises or um, these different ways of presenting the gospel material side by side of the same stuff, you'll see that Matthew and Luke agree on nothing. They don't agree in their genealogies. We're going to deal with that in a minute. Eusebius is aware the genealogy doesn't agree, and he's going to do, deal with that in almost the first the chapters of his book here, isn't he? or try to deal with it anyway. But first of all, the dates don't agree. Because in one narrative, Herod is still alive, that has to be before 4 BC. But Luke, he's read Josephus, and he knows that there was a census of, to take the taxation, and that is in 7 AD. But right there, nobody knows when Jesus was born. Because one narrative tells us it's 
before 4 BC, and the other narrative tells us it's 780. Uh, 10, 11 year gap. So when was he born? Nobody knows. One narrative defeats the other. Mark and John know this, I think, and therefore they just toss it out. They don't even mess with his infancy. John gives another, more mystical version. Mark just begins later. Mark is smart. Because he doesn't accept these stories. If he knew a story, I think he would have put it in there, don't you? He doesn't really feel he has a credible story. Now, uh, but what's my point? Not that. What is interesting to me is that Jesus' birth in both cases coincides with the revolutionary movement in Josephus. Now, we call that movement over time Zealots. That's another party, a revolutionary party, started by Judas the Galilean and, and, and this Sadduk uh, character in the Antiquities, the second book of Josephus, Sadduk is, is added. In the first, we only have that one. And then sometimes they have a different name. They're called Sicarii. Because Josephus says they later on developed a, a, an assassination streak where they would kill collaborating uh, uh, notable people, high priests and others who were collaborating with the Romans. And uh, they were called Sicarii because that's the Roman short curved knife, Sica it's called, and they used to hide it under their garments and then they would cut people's throats in the crowds according to Josephus. Josephus hates the revolutionaries. He may hate them because he's trying to survive in Rome and therefore he has to be over, you know, overstate the case. I don't think that's what these people were doing though. I don't think that's the only thing they were doing. Now these Sicarii are mentioned in Acts. When Paul is mobbed in the temple in Acts 21, when we get there, you'll see that um, the Roman soldier says to Paul, are you one of these Sicarii who uh, was led out into the wilderness? There were, I don't know how many, 3,000, 5,000, I forget what it says, Sicarii. You wouldn't know it said Sicarii unless you looked at the Greek. Because in the uh, English it probably will say, are you one of these assassins? And uh, you have to. That's why often you need the 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 um, the Greek because the Greek can help you. So even that is mentioned in the scripture. Uh, Sicarii are there. Zealots are, the, are all sometimes mentioned. Jesus has a, a a colleague, doesn't he? One of his um, one of his uh, apostles. What's his name? Simon the Zealot. Simon Zelotes. Greek is. Uh, this is again in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is read as Josephus, where the others are not always clearly having read. Now we know Luke was written after Josephus for these various things that come up from Josephus in Luke. And Zelotes is called, he isn't called Simon the Zelotes in uh, Matthew and Mark, is what's he called in Matthew and Mark? You know your scriptures. Simon the Canaanite. Well, he wasn't Simon the Canaanite. I can assure you there were no Canaanites left in Palestine at this time. In fact, if you look at the Greek, it's Canaanite, and we know what that comes from. Canaanite. Do you know what that comes from? Kana, 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 zeal for God in Hebrew. Elijah, this prophet, was Kana Elohim, a zealot for God. Luke has it right. It's Simon Zelotes in Greek. In Hebrew, Kanaim in Greek Zealot. So you have um, the outbreak of 4 BC at uh, uh, Josephus. Uh, at, now in that outbreak in Josephus, when they think uh, Herod is is uh, dead, Herod does leave instructions to his successor to round up all the notables in a stadium and kill them all when he dies. That's the son of Herod. His name is, I think, uh, Archelaus. And uh, he appears in the scripture. His name is mentioned, Archelaus. Anyway, he survives from 4 BC to 7 AD. And the, and the revolutionary strife is so great that the Romans, like Americans are doing in Iraq now, finally remove him and put a direct Roman governor in, in control. But as a prelude to putting a direct Roman governor in control, they take a census because his main job is taxing. And that's why the census is taken in 7 AD, 
when Quirinius or Cyrenius comes into the picture. And that starts the Roman governors in seven, and that starts the tax, and that's the beginning of the Zealot movement in Josephus too. Actual movement in both the antiquities and the war, and that started by Jews of Galilee. Now, he doesn't call it the Zealot movement, Josephus, at that point. He calls it the fourth philosophy. He's already enumerated three Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. And he says, the fourth philosophy I'm going to tell you about, but he doesn't really tell us about it. He doesn't name it as such. He calls it the fourth philosophical school. It's only we later calling it Zealot because that's what we see it as being. But I think a better name for it would be the Messianic Movement. The fourth movement is the Messianic Movement. And it begins just when you think it ought to begin, when there is a problem over who is going to be king in Palestine. And that's when Luke portrays Jesus as being born. So all that, to my mind, is connected. That Jesus born in 6 or 7 AD in Luke is connected to the birth of what I would consider to be the Messianic Movement. And as Josephus describes this in the Antiquities, he said this had an incredible effect on our people. Our young people were totally zealous for it, and it made a, 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 a headway into our people beyond anything you could have imagined. And then he says, all kinds of horrible things came upon our people as a result of this movement. Wars, famines, and so on. And if you look at Jesus in the scripture as we know it, the Gospels, we're not going to treat in this class. Jesus portrayed as when he's coming out of the temple at one point at, towards the end before his death or before his trial as giving what people refer to as the little apocalypse. Where he says, and uh, famines, wars, uh, people um, uh, saying all these things are going to happen after my death and uh, when you see the abomination of the desolation, standing where not, not to stand, take to the hills. This is in the synoptics again. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptics because they revolve around a similar source, so we call them uh, similar, whereas John doesn't have some of this material. He has totally more mystical material. How many are familiar with that uh, sort of oracle Jesus gives there? It's called the Little Apocalypse. How many are familiar with that? Well, you'll find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The most extensive versions are Matthew and Luke, Mark is less so, but you'll find it there. And it, most people have said this is very much like Josephus' description of what this fourth philosophy brought upon the people. Okay, so uh, the Romans bring in direct governorship. The people are not happy with the Herodians. All Herodians from then on time forth are called Herod. Again, this is not, I think, properly presented. We do not get this hatred of the Herodian family. Uh, we don't get the fact that they have to be imposed by Roman troops. We don't get the fact that Herod's father had had a Roman citizenship conferred upon him for services rendered in the initial Roman takeover of the country. We don't get the fact that he was initially a Roman governor who parlayed his governorship into a, into a uh, dynasty, all called Herod's. And uh, we don't get the impression that he killed the previously popular reigning dynasty and eliminated them. And those he didn't kill, he married or bred from, uh, called the Maccabean one. And uh, I think that gets us to where we need to be. So, having said all that and wasted all your time, let me go into the beginning of Eusebius here. I think we can pick up here and now start Eusebius. Chapter 1. It's my purpose to record a section of the uh, success of the Holy Apostles and this character in the times. This may not agree with your translation exactly, but if you get that thing I've prepared as a book that you'll have the, the exact copy of what I have here. Page 13 in that, right? Yeah. Um, um, and the Penguin one will be slightly different, I mean, because it's a different translation, but it's chapter one. Book. The calamities, you see here, first of all, innovation, greatest errors, Propagation of false doctrines, grievous wolves, unmercifully assaulting the flock of Christ. So where is you see this coming from right from the first page? A establishment theologian who doesn't like disagreement, doesn't like heresy, doesn't like differences of opinion, 
considers anyone with a different view of the, uh, 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 than his own to be a grievous wolf, a saw that's all in the flock of Christ. So, um, so he's totally established, but he doesn't like innovation. But one of the big things he's interested in, it's my intention also to describe the calamities that swiftly overwhelmed the whole Jewish nation in consequence of their plots against our Savior. So right from the get-go, does he have any sympathy for them? No. That a million, two million, ten million people die? Well, that's fine by the CDs. Because they plotted against our Savior. Well, if the Savior was worried about this, he wouldn't have come in the way he did. He wouldn't seem to be bothered by this. He thought that was part of what he had to go through. But because I don't know what party he represented. If he read at the establishment party, which he's not presented as being, then um, the establishment would have protected him, which they didn't. If he represented the revolutionary parties, well, uh, I don't think there's any plots against him from the revolutionary parties, because he represented what they represented, and he would have been part and parcel of their action. So the only plots that could have been against him would have been if he was representing the Pauline approach, because he's breaking the law of Moses. Now, Jesus is pictured in many, saying many different things in the Gospels. One thing he says, not one jot or tittle shall disappear from the law until all these things are accomplished. What he means by all these things being accomplished, no one can adequately tell you except in a sermon. Uh, he, uh, James, in the letter of James says, um, if you break one jot or tittle or one small point of the law, you're guilty of breaking it all. Uh, this is in James 2. And James is the person, we don't tell, know who he is from the letter, but as we will develop him here, James is the person, he's the law party in the Christian early history, as opposed to the non-law party. Now the question will come down is, were early Christians observing the law? That will be what will be the main issue here. Now, if Jesus resolved this issue in his lifetime, as the scriptures we have sometimes try to show or imply, then all his apostles apparently following James have it wrong. And that's why Peter is portrayed often so negatively in the scripture. Because Peter, though we all love Peter, in the scripture is portrayed often as misunderstanding the master's teaching, questioning him, sinking into the Sea of Galilee for lack of faith, denying the master three times on his death night, you know, and so on and so forth, running away, a coward, etc., 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 etc. Now that is, you say, well, that's the story. No, that's an anti-Peter approach. I'm not sure that's the whole story. You, if you take the scripture, that would be the Pauline approach. How do we know that's a Pauline approach? Because the letter of Paul to the Galatians makes it clear that Paul doesn't like Peter. Plus it makes it clear that Paul certainly doesn't like James. And it makes it clear that Peter, Paul thinks Peter's a hypocrite. Because when the sum from James came down, he who had previously been in the habit of keeping table fellowship with Gentiles and non-Jews withdrew and refused to any longer do this. Well, anyway, going back to Eusebius. Uh, so uh, the question is, where did Jesus stand on all these issues? You say, oh, well, we know. The scripture says he, he, he did this. And the apostles and the disciples and everyone else misunderstood it. You know, that's constantly the approach of the apostles. Disciples came to him and don't understand him and and he rebukes them, and nobody understands them except Roman centurions, poor Syrophoenician Canaanite women whose faith have saved them, and a lot of other simple, small people who understand him better than Jesus' own followers. And at one point, Jesus says, one sinner is worth 99 righteous ones in the wilderness. Well, the 99 righteous ones in the wilderness are what we, the Dead Sea Scroll people call themselves righteous ones there in the wilderness. In the book of Acts, which we're going to study, Peter, or now our principal leader at this point before James takes over, goes down to Jaffa. And he's standing on the rooftop looking out. In the meantime, the narrator of the book of Acts tells you 
that a Roman centurion is in Caesarea, which is where the Roman capital is, and he's sending his servant to, uh, to ask, and this Roman centurion loves Jews, and is known by the whole Jewish nation for all his good works, and is a very, very pious person, and is uh, spoken of very highly by the whole Jewish nation, which I'm sure is total rubbish. There was no Roman centurion who was spoken of highly by the whole Jewish nation at this time, because particularly the Caesarean detachment, Josephus tells you, were the most brutal and violent of all, and they provoked through their violence and brutality the war against Rome. And so brutal and violent were they that after the war, even the, even the Emperor Vespasian felt the obligation to banish them from Palestine because they were so hated by the people. Now, you know, you have to decide which is an accurate portrayal. The, the, the point being is to get Peter to visit the centurion's house. Not only a non-Jewish house, but one who wasn't keeping the law and who may not have been keeping any of the things of bodily purity that the law required, which are very onerous. I've told you about this episode before. It's a key episode in the book of Acts. It, it Paulinizes Peter. And what happens is, uh, a voice cries out to Peter, and a tablecloth is, un is unfurled from heaven and comes down. This is not, obviously, a very historical episode. Finally, when the voice cries out the third time, Peter says, okay, I have now learned not to call anything unclean or any man profane, not to make distinctions between holy and profane. Well, that's the whole point of Paul in his letters. But the Peter we meet in Galatians isn't, hasn't got that vision yet. So now if Jesus taught this, how come even in Acts' view, his closest associate, Peter and successor, doesn't know the issue? Doesn't know the resolution? How come he doesn't know Jesus already resolved this point? So my conclusion is the struggle Jesus did not resolve this point. And in fact, probably didn't teach at all what we think he taught on that issue. Because otherwise, Acts would not have felt required to give Peter, if you follow the logic, a pro Pauline vision to resolve. So finish the point. Um, what did G, where did Jesus stand on these things? I don't think we have a clear picture. But if you want to take the James side, then he didn't abolish any of these things then all these things were still required and so on. And that's going to be the argument between the James school and the Paul school. James is going to lose. In any case, Eusebius is a confirmed Paulinist. I want to describe the calamities that swiftly overwhelmed the whole Jewish nation in consequence of their plots against our Savior. How do we start this discussion? By saying, yes, there could have been plots against Paul for the reasons I just pointed out. So if Jesus was like that, that's possible. Otherwise, I don't think that that picture will really stand up very well. Anyway, to finish this chapter, whatever, therefore, next page, we deem likely to be advantageous to the proposed subject, we shall endeavor to reduce by historical narration. For this purpose, we have collected materials that have been scattered by our predecessors and called us from some intellectual meadows the appropriate extracts from ancient authors. In the execution of this work, we shall be happy to rescue from oblivion the succession is not all, at least of most noted apostles of our Lord and their churches and so on and so forth. So he is going to take materials that have even been lost in his own time, bring them together, call them, and we have to be grateful for him because he does give us materials that we have really never seen before. And then in chapter 3, he's going to get into the fact that the name Jesus actually meant something even before he became Christ that it was already something that the ancient prophets were interested in. It's now proper to show that the very name Jesus, as also Christ, was honored by the pious prophets of all. That is, uh, Jesus, as he'll show on the next page, we'll pick up there next time, comes from Joshua, Yehoshua, and so on and so forth, and it literally means Savior to him, he who saves the people. So he actually had the name of Savior, before he even became the Savior is what you see this is going to uh, discuss. And from here, it's going to go into the genealogies. Pick up there next time. Sorry to waste so much time to decide. We will now really buzz through your CBS fast.